nutrition and the role that it plays in developing bulls and getting cell cattle ready. I cannot stress to you how important, how important body condition score is to the ability of market females. Uh, this year, Purina stepped up, it was great. They've been a great ally for us in uh, working with us and being a sponsor for this. And uh, uh, at this point in time, we, we have two sections here. This is basically a female marketing talk type talk topic. We'll talk about that. Okay. Uh, but uh, basically, cell prep from a nutrition standpoint is what Dr. Hawkins is going to do. And then we've also got Sherman Vietor, who is going to talk about advertising programs. And uh, uh, I'll brag on Sherman when we get closer to time when I introduce her. But these two topics are really interrelated if you're in the, in the business of selling cattle. All right. Thanks, Bill. Can I hear you okay? Can I hear you I'm a little fuzzy around that too, so maybe you can turn that down. Just a little up. How's everybody doing? Okay. I went to grad school down at A&M. 
uh, I was around a lot of your cattle. I learned what your cattle were. I didn't know what a Catahoula curve dog was until I went down there and I figured out what they were also. And we were pretty much blue eater, border collies, and curve grams cattle up there. So I learned a lot. I work with a lot of beef master producers in my role right now. I've got one large producer in East Texas, runs a thousand cows or so, beef masters, and Charlie Bulls, they got curve red bulls. We've been weaning their calves off several years on our training program, 60 day backgrounding program. He has them so. Uh, steer calves did 3.2 pounds in 60 days. On average, heifers did 2.5. They knocked out of the park. Some of the best females that I see on any breed going out there are beef master cows when they're out there. They're phenomenal out there. So I really appreciate the breed, for what y'all done, and the quality of cattle that y'all have out there. We're going to talk a little bit about cell prep. You know, cell preparation is one of those things that's kind of necessary evil, whether you're selling private treatment or your production cell. Alright, it is a it is an emotional and financial event for the buyer and sell. You know, there's a lot of things going on. You put your time and money into that. I mean, these put these cattle all the time come like our family when we when we raise them. Also, when you sell them, that's important. That buyer is an emotional bit for him. They're going to be looking at sell catalogs. They're going to be coming out there. So when they buy an animal, it's an emotional bit for them, too. We always got to keep that in mind. It's a financial event going back and forth for both, both, both people. But you got to begin with the customer in mind at the end. That's what we're looking for. What do they want? What's the customer world want? They want a good looking at animals. Basically, docile. We all have docile cattle. They're sound, they're fertile, disease free, very productive. And they're going to, you know, you got cattle to meet all these people's production needs that are out there, whether it's milk production, or lean weight, or gear weight, or parks in area, or fertility. You all have all that for the producers that are out there. And uh, whether it's bulls, or calves, or, you know, or, or your cows. But what we're looking for when we sell cattle, or when we buy cattle, either one, most both sides, we're looking for what we call the look. What is the look? Well, we want a slick, shiny, well conditioned appearance. Uh, you know, to turn it out, we want big, middle, full appearance. Uh, you know, that's something that's pretty important. Now, we do a lot of rib and body expression correct these cattle. So we're looking for the look. If you're a buyer seller, you're looking for the look. If you go into a pen of cattle, you're going to find the one that has the look. Now, whether your pocketbook can afford it or not, that dictates what that look is worth. We always hear that. How many of y'all ever said that? Fat sales. Come on. Raise your hand. How many of y'all hear that? Fat sales. All right. You know, fat does sell to a point. You know, but it can be counterproductive as well. So, did y'all go buy that cow? That's why we wanted Dr. Looney's uh, donor cats, probably. <laughs> I'm bet. So, you know, he's talked about three inch needles and some of these darn cows are getting way too fat. Uh, you know, that cow right there probably hadn't had a calf in three or four years. She's what I call a welfare cow. She's just around the farm. She's probably got a first name basis of bossy. She's not going anywhere. You know, I'll probably have a few of those cows in places like that. Let's talk about a different type of fat cells. We get these cows too fat, they can cause some problems. We talk about fertility. One thing about the beef master industry, y'all have a phenomenal junior program. I watched it at Fort Worth several years ago, and I was just amazed when the, those heifer class from the Raptor Green over there on half of it, compared to the other half of the breed, the other breeders and the other breeders. Y'all have a tremendous program. But the one thing about it, we all have problems with show heifers trying to get them bred back. Why? Because they push those show heifers to get them too fat, and then they, they're hard to get bred back. A lot of times we get these show heifers too fat, they don't milk either. Okay, whenever you put get a heifer real fat before she reaches puberty, she deposits that fat in her udder. She puts that fat in her udder, and her lifetime milk production is going to be a lot less. Okay, so there's something about that. We develop our heifers, we don't want to get them too fat before they reach puberty. So that's something to think about that. Our donor cows, the same thing. We get our donor cows too fat, you're going to do it anyway. But Get them too fat, they're not going to be near as productive anyway. They're doing a lot more in vitro, so it doesn't really matter. It does matter. It does make guys like Dr. Lewis train those, it makes those guys work a lot harder to do it. I don't think they're quite as fertile as either. In bulls, the same quality and quantity, there is a relationship. A 
on, on fat, fat and there's growth. The bulls produce fat and there's growth. It increases uh, the temperature of their, of their testes. Now, a lot of times, or the temperature that the testes are usually five degrees below body, the normal body, body temperature. And during the summer, a lot of times bulls go infertile just because of the summer temperatures, you know, for a long period of time. Well, we start getting those bull fat, put that fat around that scrotum, we basically insulate it, you know, and when we do that, it increases the uh, temperature of those testes, and then they become a lot less fertile. Uh, yeah, so it affects in the same quality and quantity of both on our bulls. We don't want to get our bulls too fat either. So, and sometimes we over condition females in that last trimester. We can actually increase birth weight. We can cause some problems, especially the heifers. Do that. Uh, they say it's only about five pounds, but I think if you push those efforts real hard, uh, you can increase those weights uh, much larger than that. So, look at the future production, the milk production, and heifers talk about that. When you get bulls or females too fat, they're not near as athletic, they have trouble moving around a lot, and then they can eventually get it injured a lot more easily as well. And then when you sell, whether it's a bull or a female, and they turn them out in pasture, what's the first thing they're going to do? going to melt. They can melt in a month, they can melt in two months, but they spend a lot of money on that female, that bull, and all of a sudden that customer goes out there and looks at that female one day, that bull, and man, she was poor body condition, she got parasites working against her, a lot of things are going against her, and then he's like, man, I don't know if I'll go back and buy another female from him or another bull from him, so you got to think about things like that when we get these evidence too fat. So, Chance mentioned this a little bit earlier ago. This is a part of my master's work at Texas A&M when I looked at Dr. Forrest. And we looked at bulls uh, in a feedlot environment on conventional rations. And these were on a forage on that ration uh, bulls that were out on pasture. And he mentioned a little bit about that. But there's about 100 pounds of difference at the end of these weights right here. But this is kind of Paul Harvey, the rest of the story. We took the seven bulls from the conventional ration group, we took another seven bulls uh, out of the forage and active ration group, and we sent them to a multiple sire breeding ranch in southern New Mexico. Pretty rough country, all right? Just turned them out there in a very large number of cows. So uh, cows ended up having calves, moved back to the calves next year. And we genotyped all the calves back to those bulls, so we know exactly which bull they were out of. Which sire group did y'all think uh, bred the most cows? This group right here, about, about 10, 15 percent more. Okay, but when we weighed those bulls, we took those bulls off that pasture at the end of the breeding season after 60 days. It was a 60 day deal. What do you think those body weights were? These bulls right here were actually 100 pounds lighter than those bulls right here. They actually melted and pulled back up because they weren't athletic. They weren't used to do it. They melted and fell apart out there. That's probably one reason they didn't breed as many cows as well. So that's kind of the rest of the story there as well. So I'll talk about cell prep. I'm going to talk kind of about three things today. I'm talking about deworming. You know, we don't talk about deworming. Everybody's got a good deworming program. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I'll talk about the importance of mineral nutrition, especially when it comes to fertility. I'm going to talk a little bit about the feeding program. The feeding program is pretty simple. The deworming program, you really need to work with your veterinarian, and you also need to pull fecal samples. And the reason I'll talk a little bit about this is because I work with a lot of bull guys, and they'll call me up and they say, hey, these bulls aren't performing. I'll go look at it. It's July 1. These bulls still have hair on them like that. They're gaining a pound and a half, two pounds a day. They're eating right exactly what they're supposed to eat on their feet. I know there's something going on. The little bull should be slick. Should be gaining about three pounds plus. That there's something going on. So anyway, I go. I said, "Deworm." Say, "I'll deworm them a month and a half ago." Even weaned them. So they look for me and think, "No, they're not worming." Let's pull cool fecal samples to find out. So just go out there and take some fecal samples out there, and then you need to find a veterinarian that does what I call sugar water flow. And most of these vet veterinarians will do basically. It's just a standard. A kind of salt water flow. Most folks, those don't float the eggs like they should on cattle. It's a good thing they use them for dogs and cats, but use a true sugar water flow. Man, I, I was in East Texas, I called like nine veterinarians before I found one that actually did it. Bred a sample to him, 
They tested it, sure enough, both the rules were still warming. So we went back in there and they dewormed them with two dewormers, cleaned them up about a month later, and they need to look like the same rules. And we had a lot of problems with you this year in the spring because it's so wet, the cattle were really warming. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, something called double deworming. We've used so many injectables and forearms over the years that we've got away from what we call a lot armor. Lot armor would be like say car valets and pedicure like that. They get two different types of, of parasites. So when you deworm, if you use a, your forearm or injectable that you're using, you use it, come in there with a the lot armor, you're going to get those animals really clean. And uh, one little place that I work with, very large, they sell about 500 bulls a year. Uh, they had bulls on test, bulls look good, and they were using one warmer and uh, went in there and pulled people's on. Sure enough, they had uh, brown stump worms and they had pig grip, which those didn't get. We came in there with, uh, with safeguard cubes and uh, cleaned them up. Now, we made that safeguard cattle cube dewormer. It works very well. You don't have to run through the sheep. You know, if you ever try to get a wild warmer in an animal, it's kind of a pain. You get these Manicure or valvase or something like that. Uh, so this is very safe. Valvase, you have to be very careful on giving it to pregnant animals in that early gestation. You can actually be bored with it. But this is a good uh, deworm to work with your current deworming program. And I'm, I'm a firm believer that you need to bribe a name brand. Don't go buy the cheap generic. I'm out on cheap generics and all that. I think we're seeing a lot more parasite resistance out there. Uh, I think a lot of guys are just using, you know, forearms as flock control. I think that increases your parasite resistance as well. So, on a bull, on a cow, you know, anywhere from 5 to 10 pounds, depending on the side of the, side of the animal, is how much you're going to be on that. So, a good deworm program will make your bee program a lot, a lot more efficient out there. Now, I'll talk a little bit about the wind and rain all season four with what we call a beta four XPC. Chance talks a little bit about this on lean calves, and it works tremendously. It also works on, on cows, and also works on bulls. It's an all season four, basically, it's four percent phosphorus. And the Aveda four is an organic trace complex. Basically, uh, we get it from Zenpro. It's copper, manganese, cobalt, and zinc. All right. What they do is they take a mineral, they attach it to a protein or amino acid, and so it's working the body readily picked up the amino acid or protein and the animal will utilize it a lot more efficiently that way. Okay. And then XPC is a yeast product for not the yeast. Some of y'all might have heard of Amfern. This is a lot very similar to that. This is everything you can get in an animal. This is uh, on the mineral side, the mineral tub that has all that you need uh, for a good mineral program on that. If you look at the Zenpro of A4 of some of the research that's out there, uh, just feeding it to three to four years of age of cows, uh, they decrease deep, deep, uh, the, uh, uh, the calving interval by 16 days. That's almost a full cycle over, over a year, over a three year period is what they've seen. So if you get your females to cycle, full cycle quicker, that's pretty big, just by increasing uh, the available for in those cows. So what I recommend is, you know, 30 to 60 days before you start uh, calving, get those tubs out. 30 or 60 to 90 days after you calve, keep them out. Then put them out again when you go to those calves. If you're doing any type of embryo work, AI work, you can get these products out there at least probably about 60 days before you start doing uh, flushing or things like that. Zenpro uh, available for the bulls. Uh, it fed to some bulls, seven bulls in 42 days uh, the program, and they almost increased, uh, they almost doubled when those bulls came to puberty. 79% uh, or more puberty came to puberty a lot quicker than the one that was just a typical top of the sulfate top of the program. So it does increase fertility substantially. I talked to Palmer talked about the same thing. Preparation. It all depends on your body condition, where you're at, what you're trying to do. You know, so the ideal, we like to sell cattle in body condition source, four, six, or seven. A lot of guys are trying to try to push them to eights, but six and seven is where we're trying to be at, where they have to look. 
animal. So how far out? If you're inviting this to score a five, it's going to take you 30, 45 days, maybe it'll take 60 days to get there. Uh, Vitamin fish score six, about 30 days to two weeks. Vitamin fish score, score six plus two weeks. It all depends on the frame size of your cattle, the forage you have, the body condition scores you are already in. But from go to a body condition score of five to six, that's going to be 70, 67 pounds. Let's say 60 pounds to move from there to there. Well, to do that in 30 days, that cow's got to two pounds a day. So to do that, you want to be efficient. Big cow, maybe 90 pounds. So you're going to have to gain, you know, uh, three pounds a day to get there. That's sometimes hard to do. So you need to really figure out where you are in your body condition score to find out where they're at. And uh, you know, we don't want them to sell them when they have ribs. We want them to be pretty smooth at body condition score six, seven. They're going to start getting pulled up in the brisket. They're going to start dropping in the flank. They're going to have some fat around their tail heads. Okay. And it's a lot more expensive to get there, but like I said, some kind of fat cells, but we don't want to get them over a lot of initial core set. Then you can start going back to the on that. So, we've got a product called Accuration Cell Prep. Complete. It's a complete feed, lemon half protein, free fat, it's a 16 fiber, and 22% rough. Remember, Dr. Farm talked about fiber rough for two different traits of things. It is a texture feed, it is a complete feed. You can feed it without any hay, but you can also feed it with hay as well. It contains rumensin in it. Uh, in the rat, most of them will have rumensin. By onophore, it'll help with coccidiosis and make this cattle more efficient. And consumption should be somewhere around two and a half percent of body weight. <coughs> you know, if you got some pigs out there, you keep the hay out there in front of them. But on full feed, it'll be somewhere about two and a half percent of body weight on that. On that. We usually like to put cattle on it about two weeks to three weeks before. Sale. You know, uh, I'm sure Jeremy will be talking about this. But when you get ready for a sale, you're going to do a lot of things. You're going to take pictures for a catalog. You're going to take a picture for a catalog in months to two months out. Okay, if you're going to be doing a fertility test on your bulls, uh, maybe scanning them, uh, doing a trick test, you're going to do that probably three to four weeks before the sale. That's right after you get through doing that, that's a good time to start feeding the bulls or any females on, on this type of product. So, uh, it's designed to be set that cell feeder. Uh, I recommend having a lot more bunk space. One to two feet for full. You can clean your room with that. The same for water and hay. A lot of times we don't think about water, but you get during the summer or sometime of the year, water, bulls can drink a lot of water. And if you don't have enough trough space to get water, the bulls aren't going to drink enough water. It's going to affect their intake when you start putting them up in pens. Okay? So there is a, there is a, a so much space for bulls that they need. Water, make sure you got plenty of water. Same thing for hay. We usually recommend about 20 bulls for a round of hay. Like you don't think about space for, for hay managers as well. So uh, you think about that. You can hand feed it. We recommend keeping it out all the time. You do also need to have twice the hay available. Keep it in and keep it in your uh, The good thing about the accuracy cell prep is that it will put a lot of business. Okay. It'll give them a big belly, it'll give them full, it'll give them that traditional look without giving them too fat. They will still look athletic, they will still uh, look very good, they'll get that feel and gut in them that we're looking for in cattle today. We do have a lot of other products that are out there. Uh, some, some areas just sell prep that's not available. Now, we've got some different, we're going to talk a little bit about them, but we got guys that are trying to develop animals on liquids, blocks, and tubs. You're never going to get there. Why are you never going to get there? Because the liquid, blocks, and tubs, they're more of a maintenance type of product out there. Or if you're going to grow them, you're going to grow them real slow. They're not going to get there real quick. So that's one thing that's out there. If you want to try to uh, get some weight gain on forage, we've got Akrash and Cadillacers. It works very well on heifers. Uh, we don't have very many people with bells bulls very, very much on Cadillacers anymore. Gone to the forage extenders where you use it with little to no forage and don't put them more than middle, they don't give them really full and blue. So, those are some different options. Now, liquids, uh, we mentioned this a lot of times, people know about all of our products, but we've got all kinds of different liquids. Uh, the lower the protein and the liquid, the more they'll eat. These are some of the highest fat liquids out there, and also some of the lowest forage. These are we don't use any byproducts of the molasses industry. Straight molasses, we use uh, straight, uh, 
soybean oil for a fat source, no animal byproducts in that, and this will fit a lot of all natural programs that's out there as well. But we've got some guys that will develop heifers on the 12 or 16 percent liquid if they're trying to grow them out. If they're trying to get a heifer gain one and a half pounds a day, one and one pound, that will work on those. Uh, most times we just maintain our females on 28, 32. If you got the first calf heifers, they probably need to be on 16 to 24 percent to get there. We just want to keep them in good, good shape. The ag crashing block is another one. I don't really recommend it for first calf heifers. They're not going to eat enough of it. They're also shedding their teeth at the same time. Uh, so that's sometimes a problem. It works very good. You don't need to whip around you on maintaining females. Then we have two products. These are bait tubs. Bait tubs, the difference between a bait tub and an agrash block. The agrash block will allow a cow to eat two to four pounds if she needs it. The bait blocks will shut them off at one pound. If you've got knee high green grass out there, they're going to eat one pound of the head of bait. If you've got burnt forage in the middle of August, they're going to eat one pound of the day. The agrash block and the liquids, their consumption is going to fluctuate based off your forage. You've got really good forage. A lot of times our cattle will quit eating them by April, into March, April, and into May, and they'll start up to the end of June when that four before it starts burning off. They'll be shut off of it. But on liquid, average consumption on root cows about a pound per head per day, uh, year round. We've got guys that feed cows for less than 100 bucks a cow. We've got some guys in Louisiana, a lot of forests, that feed cow year round on liquid for $50 a cow. Cheapest, most economical way. So we can actually get a lot of cattle to keep them in very good condition. Year, you know, pretty close to sale condition, just off liquid, you maintain it, keep it out there year round. Then, when you're ready to go sell, you put them on something like that, trash and sell prep, or you put them on one of the extenders, get the middle in them, get that extra money that you need without it. So, the cattle Lenifer program, this is a program that's been around since the 1980s, it's been very successful. We've developed a lot, a lot of bulls on it, a lot of females over the years on pasture. Work very well successfully. We primarily typically use the Akrash Cattle Program now for developing heifers. We only need heifers to gain, uh, you know, one and a half, maybe two pounds at the most. A lot of times we'll start them off on a cow for number one, and then we can go to a two, and maybe two and a half, and we can really shut it down. We can get to the number three, and they start getting up uh, eight, nine hundred pounds. Just want to kind of keep, keep going. Uh, I've actually been on ranches before that the heaviest calves they would off their range has been off their first calf heifers. Why would a first calf heifer right, wean off the heaviest calf when they're off their whole range? You know? The reason not was they kept them on the cattle from you know, three all the way through to those females that really milled calves and some of it. But they took care of them, they pushed them through that bill and they got rebred back very quickly. So you can actually uh, take care of those heifers and you can get them the second time. I got a processed pellet on them there. What is a processed pellet? These are very high in fat. If you look at them, they're both 4 to 7 percent fat. A lot of times they're higher than that, but they're actually tagged. And it's hard to keep the pellet together it's got that much fat in it. When we first started making these, they were in the bill form. And we put them in those cell feeders and they wouldn't flow. Well, we started running through a, a pellet dye to get a pellet on there so it comes come through the flow. So it'll start off as a pellet, but one time it gets to the bottom of the pan, it's kind of a really tall pellet. And that's the way it's designed to be, uh, be designed for. Now, the forage extenders are a little bit different. These are the ones that Dr. Farm was talking about, it has coxie holes in it. It's got the roughage in there. The cost of gain is about the same as the cattle lifter. They're going to eat more, but the cost of the gain is about the same. This is one that we choose on bulls, and if we're really trying to push a set of heifers, a set of uh, cattle for sale. These are the ones that we like also inside that uh cell prep. Uh, they go with these, they go from three to eight fat all the way to five and quarter. Uh, the difference is they've got a lot more roughage in them. Uh, even that got more roughage than actually cell prep does. How much they'll eat will basically off the percent body weight and we'll push them on that or just take around one, only really two, two or three quarter percent of their body weight. And uh, if you've got hay out there, if you've got forage out there, you knock that down to one and a half, two percent of the body weight, depending on what quality of the forage is. Okay, if they get to eat too much on 
peppers, or even a little bit start getting too fat, you want to slow them down. We've got guys that will they'll get their gear, their gear numbers, they'll get their ultrasound scans, and then they just kind of want to slow those bulls down for a little while until right before the cell, we'll put them in and we'll move them to a four extender number two, slow those bulls down. We've got some older bulls that we're trying to maintain, some manage, and take care of. Uh, then we can move them on to the four extender number three and maintain them there. And it's also a process of killing a lot of times it's much better than color there. So uh, that's pretty easy uh, on our product lineup. The main thing about cell prep is starting early enough to know how many days it's going to take you to get there. Don't get cattle too fat, all right? We mirror fat cells, but we want cattle that will perform once the uh, customer purchases it. We want them coming back. So we don't want to have any feed problems. We don't want to push them too hard. And uh, that's one reason we like that crash and sell prep. We don't have any feed problems. We don't have any that crash force stiffer. We don't have any feed problems there as long as you manage the program right. So uh, that's pretty much all I have on cell conditioning. Thank you, Sherry. Are you up there? 